many of you know that last week I was with Maddie in the desert of Utah and Nevada. We were staying mostly at Zion National Park, but we did some things outside of the park, and one of the places we went was Buckskin Gulch, which has to win just for its name, Buckskin Gulch. There was a moment where Maddie said, what's a gulch? And I said, this is a gulch. It was very helpful. Um, <laughs> Buckskin Gulch is probably the longest slot canyon in the world. A slot canyon is formed by uh, erosion by mostly water and the things that are carried with water. And a slot canyon is open at both ends. So you can enter into the slot canyon, you walk through it, and then you can walk out of the slot canyon. And Buckskin Gulch is about 16 miles long. We did not do the whole 16 miles, but um, it is quite dramatic. Uh, slot canyons, like Buckskin Gulch, are only a few feet across. And uh, Buckskin Gulch, uh, the top of the ravine was about at the pinnacle of the church. I mean, it was just you know, squeezing through this very thin crack of rock. And this is a little bit of Buckskin Gulch. And one of the things I noticed very quickly, and you, it, every time you could not see it then, was that one wall would jut out. And right where one wall jutted out, the other wall would jut in. And then that wall would jut out, and then this wall would jut in. Um, and it, 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 would, it would just do this. Uh, even to the point where if there was a bulge like at head level, invariably there would be uh, a push in on this side. Like everywhere there was a positive here, there was a negative here. It just went back and forth. This is uh, apparently called a pinch and swell. And you can tell how it's formed as the water's carrying the sand and the rocks and the branches and everything through, it carves out one side and then it gets shot over and it carves out the other side and it comes over and it keeps doing that, making this very dramatic thing that looked like gears that could like fit together or a zipper that could come together. It was quite amazing. Our gospel lesson today has pinches and swells. It's two stories, two healing stories, which are woven into one. And where the story of one person goes this way, the story of the other person goes that way. And it just goes like this. There is the story of a young girl and the story of an older woman, already one pinch and swell. The uh, little girl is the daughter of a leader of the synagogue, which in that time and in that culture would have been a prominent position. He, uh, the family would have had resources and connections. This girl is very ill, and so she has her father to go and advocate for her. The woman has spent through all of her resources and has no one to advocate for her, so she has to go to Jesus on her own. So one family is resource and one isn't. One has connections and one doesn't. Um, the little girl's condition is acute. It just comes upon her quickly and devastatingly, and she is at the point of death. The woman's condition is chronic. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. In fact, one of the most dramatic pinches and swells of this story is that the girl is 12 years old and the woman has been suffering with this condition for 12 years. And so for as long as this girl has been alive, this woman has been suffering with this condition. The girl with this acute illness, whatever it was, dies. The woman does not. She's able to walk to Jesus on her, under her own power. And probably the most important of the pinches and swells 
of these two stories is that to heal the little girl, Jesus goes to her. He reaches out his hand, takes her hand in his. Jesus touches her and tells her to get up. Little girl, get up. And she does. The woman goes to Jesus and reaches out her hand to touch him. He, apparently, as the story goes, he didn't intend to heal her. He just felt power leave his body. So he, he like, intentionally heals the little girl, but somehow this woman, by touching his cloak, sort of takes a healing for herself. These two stories just go like this. And I, I think there's something to the, the zipper nature of these two stories that are woven into one. Um, two things with that. The first thing is that I think one of the things this, this uh, weaving of these two stories tells us is that we don't all have the same relationship with God. We don't all come to God in the same way. We don't all live out our faith in the same way. There is no Christian cookie cutter that just like makes Christians and we all do the same thing and we all speak the same things and we all read the same things and we all watch the same things and we all, you know, no. These two, these two women who are healed could not be more different and yet they both come in contact with Jesus in remarkably different ways. One of my favorite ways to think about this for myself is uh, I have a sister. Many of you know my sister. She's eight years younger than I am. And as brother and sister, we share a mother. And uh, many of you know my mother as well. And so we each have a relationship with my mother, and yet each of those relationships are very different. One of my favorite ways of, of remembering this is that uh, both my sister and I lived in England for a short time. I spent a year there. She studied uh, a, a semester of college in England. My mom came over to visit each of us while we were in England. And when she came to visit me, we saw every church in the south of England. And we went by a church. We went into the church. We just marveled at churches. When my mom went to visit my sister, my mother saw the inside of every pub in the south <laughs> of England. So, <clears throat> same mother, two people with two very different relationships. We all have the same God and Father of us all, but because we are each different, we are going to have different relationships with God. It is going to look different, not because God is different, but because we are different. And I, the, the, the great biblical example of this is Peter and Paul. Peter followed Jesus around for three years, uh, intensely. Listened to him teaching, watched him perform miracles and healings like this one. Uh, and even after three years, he wasn't a hundred percent bought in. Jesus is uh, on trial for his life, and Peter denies even knowing him. Paul, in one dramatic moment, he's on a horse on his way to Damascus. The flashing light, uh, he's struck blind. He hears the voice of Jesus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And his life is utterly changed forever. Peter is like a slow boil. And Paul gets, like, zapped in a microwave, right? There's, there's not a, it's not like Peter does it better than Paul or Paul does it better than Peter. They each have a dramatic and fruitful relationship with Jesus. But they are different. Just like this little girl and this woman. Uh, and so our relationships with God are going to be different. The second thing that I find great meaning in the story is not in their differences, but in their big similarity. 
so I said a few moments ago that one of the differences is that the girl dies and the woman uh, is healed while she is still alive, but it's a little more complicated than that. And I, we miss it because uh, we don't come to the scriptures with the same eyes as people would have 2,000 years ago. But I think the people 2,000 years ago would have picked on this, picked up on this pretty quickly. There is a whole thing in the Old Testament, and particularly the Torah, around blood. Um, in uh, Leviticus 17, we find, if any one of the house of Israel or of the aliens who resides among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut that person off from the people. Kind of clear, right? We don't eat blood. And then here's, here's the why. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And uh, if, if you go home and read Leviticus 17, it says this uh, 10 different ways. Don't eat blood, don't eat blood, life of the flesh is in the blood. Don't eat blood, you'll be cut off because the life of the flesh is in the blood. By the end of Leviticus 17, you're like, okay, okay, I got it. Um, blood was, uh, one, when it was inside the body, was totally fine. But once blood came outside the body, it was like nuclear material. If someone was bleeding and they sat on a chair, you could not then just go and sit on that chair. If someone was bleeding, you could not just go up and touch them because then you would become ritually impure. You couldn't just hastily throw together a rare hamburger and eat it without uh, ingesting blood and violating this strong command. In fact, our brothers and uh, sisters uh, of the Jewish faith still do this. They drain every drop out of blood out of their meat. That's what made meat kosher. Not because blood is dirty, not because blood is bad, but because blood is sacred. The blood is life. It is life. And so you have this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And so for 12 years, what has been leaking out of her body, oozing out of her body? And so, medically, she's not dead. But biblically, she's been losing her life for 12 years. For 12 years, she's been dying. And this little girl and this woman, therefore, in this encounter with Jesus, where one is touched by Jesus and the other goes and touches Jesus herself, each of these people are brought from death to life. Through all the pinches and swells of this story, it's going in one direction, and that direction is towards life. And so with all of the differences in our lives, all of the various pinches and swells, if we were a canyon, uh, we would uh, go in and out and undulate all over the place, and it would be beautiful. Probably even more beautiful than good old buckskin gulch. But each of us can move in that direction from death to life through this encounter with Jesus. And so, throughout the week, but especially today, especially um, perhaps when you come forward for Holy Communion, take a moment within yourself to have that bravery within you to reach out and touch him. Or if you can't do that, then at least open yourself up to be touched by him. And therefore, 
with these two remarkable ladies. He brought from death. 